Okay, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for asking me to come today. Um, wow. I'm not an archaeologist, I'm a forester. <laughs> right. um, as Jill's already explained to you, um, this Ben Heath Landscape Project is a joint initiative between the Baylors of Ben Heath and Aberdeen University. The aim is to encourage people to question their landscape through archaeology, historical, wildlife, and oral research. So first of all, you want to know where is Ben Heath, and who are the Baylors, and what's so exciting about this hill called Ben Heath. And basically, I'm going to talk to you about how the project has evolved. And really, I'm going to finish off with the future. And this is where I want your help, please. So, this is Ben Heath in the northeast of Scotland. This is Ben Heath. It's a long ridge, it's about uh, three and a half miles long. That's another tap. You can see it in position here in the northeast of Scotland. And it's, Benny. it's not just a, a red dot, but that's the rough location. And this is the uh, hill from looking from the north, uh, looking south. Okay, there's another tap. We're going across Craig Shannock, Oxen Craig. In fact, Oxen Craig, which is here, is actually the highest point. And I hate to be in Perthshire, and when we're looking over on the west coast, this is only uh, five to eight metres high. This is now looking south in the north direction. It's quite a dramatic hill in a very flat uh, landscape. So the Vale is of Ben Heath, uh, as Jill's already explained, it's 40 years this year and we've had lots of celebrations over the last um, few months. Uh, we're a charity, we're basically friends of Ben Heath if you like, um, and the actual number of members in September 2013 was 2,963 members. And obviously from my voice you can tell that I'm not from the North East. Um, I can say fit like, and the folk in the land and the land and the folk, but that's as far as it goes, and I wouldn't like to be patronising um, in that sense. Um, I basically came up to Aberdeen to study forestry, and uh, got married on the hill, and then got hooked. Uh, so that's where I come from. Um, and I got, I'm very interested in the sort of wildlife. Um, I do actually work for the Forest Commission in this area and sort of look at the social history. We have lots of legends. We have giants on the hill. Uh, we have maidens that get taken away by devils and lots of interesting things. Another picture of the hill. <laughs> so why is this hill so special? We've got with the tap here that's got a, uh, an Iron Age hill fort on the top, it's not vitrified, so it's a scheduled monument. We have uh, hut settlements over here, these both are scheduled monuments. We have scheduled monuments over here, there are hut circles, there's a burial cairn, and there's an ogham stone. The legends, I'm sure you're all interested in legends, or oral, sort of oral traditions, there's a giant on Ben Heath that laid down here, this is called Little John's Lake. And this giant lobbed stones over towards Tappard North, which is Rhine, which is in the more westerly direction. This is a photo of the aerial, um, uh, aerial photograph of the fort itself. As you can see, it's made out of two walls. Lots of the walls have tumbled down. Originally, um, we've been told it was probably about 30 feet high, but it's gone over the foundations here. And it was these stones that were logged at uh, Tappard North. And interestingly enough, Tappard North is actually a vitrified fort. What's interesting about Ben He, a lot of people think it's a volcano. And in actual fact, although it's volcanic like rock, it's actually very hard wearing granite on the top. And Mother Tap is obviously uh, the local, in the local dialect, that's Mother's Breast. <coughs> so we've got um, the, um, lots of history on Benny. And also we've got people that lived on the slopes of Benny. 
And this is the Benahi, known as the Benahi colonists. Now, interesting commentary. I used to think, uh, coming from England, Englandshire, uh, that a common was open to everybody. But in the legal context, uh, the definition is a common or commonty is land possessed in common by different proprietors. No common proprietors. So apparently in the 18th and 19th century, about half a million acres are recorded in Scotland that were sort of common tea. And on this common tea, in, at the beginning of the 1800s, uh, people from the neighbouring estates moved to the slopes of Benahee. And this here is one of the houses. This, uh, if you can remember, I showed you a map earlier on of Ben Heath, that's another tap here. Um, as time went on, the local lairds that were in the neighbouring estates around Ben Heath decided they wanted to have a bit of the action and control Ben Heath. Ben Heath has resources in the sense of wood. Um, there are stones, granite uh, on the hill, uh, the opportunity to shoot, uh, to uh, catch deer. Um, and they wanted to have a bit more control of the people that were living on the slopes of Ben Heath. And by 1850, there were about 60 people living in this area here, the community in here. And so the local uh, lairds went to Edinburgh in the court session and divided Benahee up. You can see all here, there's sort of the nine lairds in here. These here are the sort of tops of the hill. So my history is not very good, I'm sort of jump all over the place, they get a bit excited about Ben Heath. But this is a picture of one of the uh, colony houses, and this is obviously 1937. This house uh, has, um, we reckon this the, um, the sides of the, the uh, house have been built up, but originally under the corrugated iron here, when you look uh, today, you can actually see underneath the corrugated iron is straw, and also we can find heather in there. But a lot of this now is actually a ruin. So this house here was um, lived in by George Esson, and Esson was a famous, one of, quite an infamous uh, colonist, and he was uh, well known for building dry stone dikes in the area. So we've got a lot of dikes that are sort of made of granite, uh, obviously, in the area. So he was the last one. But he actually, um, a lot of the colonists lived on the slopes of Benhe, they built the houses themselves, and um, the, when the local leads decided to divide Benhe up, they actually um, suddenly started charging rent to these people. So a lot of them couldn't afford it because they built these houses with their own hands. Uh, and some of them went to the poor houses. Uh, some of them went uh, working elsewhere. But this community was actually made from different people throughout Scotland. So there's people coming from Sutherland, uh, some people coming from sort of Glasgow area, and they came and made their lives on sort of the slopes of Benahee. I love this picture. <laughs> Apparently, he used to wave his stick. We still actually know people who, as young children, went up Ben Heath, and this gentleman here apparently waved his stick at people and said, Get away! Uh, but uh, he was actually uh, certainly an interesting character, and there are sort of various written stories about him. And he did a lot to um, try and promote the colonist culture because a lot of people saw them as underdogs. Um, you know, they were just like sort of riffraff. But in actual fact, they did a lot, uh, which we're sort of discovering as part of this project, to improve the land, and certainly the houses are a lot more complicated than we originally thought. I'm very much a working hill, uh, and obviously with a forestry background, I like these sort of pictures. Uh, it makes me sort of realise that God, we have come a long way uh, since nine, uh, 1920. Uh, chainsaws were invented in 1960, and now we're using things like harvesters and forwarders. So, uh, What's interesting, I was at a, a slideshow not that long ago and a lady said, oh, I think that's my granddad. I thought, wow. <laughs> so I, think, I think it was this gentleman here. <laughs> okay, so I've told you a bit about the Baileys and hopefully I've made you sort of see why Ben, he's a bit uh, exciting. Normally I jump up and down here and sort of get very excited, but I'll just stay with the uh, mic microphone. So, uh, we're a voluntary group, very keen on sort of wildlife and things like that, and we sort of thought, hmm, actually we'd like to learn more about these colonists, these people who live on the slopes of Benny. We knew that they um, were sort of quite poor people, uh, we didn't know their names, we didn't really know the names of the houses, as I said, there was about 60 people, and looking for us, we've got Aberdeen University that's not that far away, 
and we went to the anthropology department and an American lady was doing research on the folk in the northeast and we as Baileys had a legacy left to us and we were able to fund this research which was the looking at the Bedley colonists. So that was our start with Aberdeen University. In a na naive sense, we thought, oh, that's fine, we've made contact with Aberdeen University. Aha, that's just one department. And sometimes departments don't speak to each other. <laughs> By the way, this is on sale today at a cheaper price than £10. It's £8, so if anyone's interested in having a look at that, that's fine. So, uh, we're a desperate group of people, we're all sort of different individuals. I call myself um, an outsider. Um, and outsiders have lots to give, and uh, insiders have lots to give as well. So if anybody's ever read Alistair Macintosh's The Soul and the Soul, and the Soul, that's a really insight book, and he talks about how volunteers in a community are really important. And anyway, this Colin Shepherd, I don't know if any of you remember Ian Shepherd? Yeah. Yes, okay, well, no, no relation. <laughs> 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 and then you have the garden path there. <laughs> Colin jumps around as well. And he came to the Baileys and said, oh, I'm interested in archaeology. And I thought, oh, right, okay, right. Um, we've funded this um, columnist book. Um, maybe we need to sort of think about the archaeology and start questioning all that. At the time, we were starting to wonder why, you know, some of the things didn't sort of tie up, you know, that uh, these people were seen as riffraff when the house structure seemed pretty good. The way they were fertilised in the fields, the fields seemed quite extensive. So, Again, luckily for us, somebody left us some money. And uh, we thought, well, okay then, so we started 2011. Now, obviously, the Bailey's been going 40 years, but we've never done any really archaeology um, studies in any depth. So, Colin, uh, we had two stages. And Colin, first of all, went to Edinburgh and went to the special collections at Aberdeen to look what was out there. And then he started networking because, as I said to you before, we realised it wasn't just um, an anthropology department, there was actually an archaeology department. And interestingly enough, when I uh, th thought we were going to meet the archaeologists, I thought, oh gosh, they'll be really old. Um, and guess, who, guess what? I was older than them. <laughs> so, this is where the partnership started to develop. And I would say it's an ongoing partnership. So, how do we get people involved in archaeology? Well, this is me saying, because I don't really know, know, know anything about archaeology, but I want to get involved, I want to just dig a hole and find out what's there. Come on, it's on the doorstep. Uh, uh, come on, Jackie, you're going to have to uh, learn that it's actually a bit more complicated than that. But however, we all have our different levels of how we can get involved. And this was great for me, because this didn't require any expertise at all. So we ran an event of shovel pivoting. This was basically Colin starting that September, and as you can see, at the end of September, he's running shovel pitting, so this is pretty good. And this is uh, this is a mapping out. He'd already mapped out some of the uh, remains of the houses. This is the field structures here, and we started shovel pitting. So every ten meters, we were digging a hole. Um, I suppose you all know this already, don't you? Yes, I'm, to, I'm speak, speaking to the people who, don't, who know more, much more about archaeology than me. But what was lovely was shovel pitting. We were sieving to see what we could find. This was background information to find out what actually was going on in these places. It was all ages were involved in this. And I just thought, wow, this is great. And also, I should mention here, we started getting involved with Nessa and Moira somewhere over there. <laughs> so that was great. Um, again, we had uh, people wandering past and with their sort of handbags, they couldn't bear to get stuck in, so they were looking as well. Again, this lady knew uh, some thin latters, so she was related to some of the people that lived on the slopes of Ben -E. What's wonderful about this project is that there are so many people, and even uh, Leaf, who I'll come uh, talk about in a minute, she was saying that she met somebody the other day who was related to the Essen family. So this was us digging, and we did actually find quite a lot of different pottery in this area. Naively, I thought, oh, we found all this stuff, so the experts, the archaeologists, will tell us what it is. And we'll take hold of it, we'll own it, we can display it. Uh -uh, it's not as easy as that. It takes a long time, and they all have to be washed and found. And this is our, after the shovel pitting, this is Rick here, uh, this is Jeff, and this is Colin. And this is quite a, a common stance with archaeologists. <laughs> I haven't acquired that yet.
Okay, so this was really the uh, synopsis of what we found at the various places. This A-frame uh, refers to one of the houses. We didn't actually know what the name of this house was, and the Forest Commission at the time had a, an A-frame structure nearby, so we called it the A-frame. But this was the names from Jennifer's work that we were able to work out what the names of these houses were. And you can see, and uh, Leaf has actually brought some of this pottery, well, other pottery from other times up there. So we're getting an idea of what we're finding. And this was useful in the sense of uh, other research. <coughs> Normally I go on too fast, I've got to slow down in my notes. So, getting information out to the community, which is really important. So, this is the newsletter that we did. And from this, we sort of realised that we needed to, to work with the university and get some funding to get them involved. And we were lucky enough to get the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and this was able to uh, start training volunteers in this sort of uh, long journey. So these are the sort of events that we did. Unfortunately, um, these were all happened over June, and it was mad. I think our cams came out. It was just mad time. Unfortunately, our cams could only come in at the sort of weekend uh, during the week, so there was quite a few volunteers who weren't able to come to that. But lots of these sort of things, it was just a mad whirlwind. As you can see, this was from the shovel pitting, and we got more people sort of involved. So it was a great start, a stepping stone. As part of this money, we also were able to run um, continuing professional development, and this was with local schools, because Colin started working with schools in the local area. So this was a great opportunity for teachers to get involved in archaeology. I'm just going to run through some of these slides, but this is some of the events that we ran in 2012. Again, this was wonderful. This is a fishing rod with a camera on top of it, and this is taking pictures of one of the colonists' houses. So this is the courtyard here, and this is the houses here. So, okay, so that was a mad month of June, and we realised that we really needed to start getting a bit more involved in this archaeology, and a lot more to discover. And again, the university were able to apply more, uh, for more research money, and through the uh, arts and uh, research, Heritage, we were lucky to get uh, more money. And we, as you see from the photograph earlier on, there's a lot of his historical interest on Benny, and we carried on looking at these colony houses. And we've got Leif, who's here with us today. Leif, can you wave your hand somewhere? Okay, she's right at the back. Uh, and Leif is being uh, paid for full time, and she's coming from North Light Heritage. And Colin has still continued. Now, Colin is amazing. A member of the community, he's an archaeologist. He was actually giving the bailiffs of Benhi, we were paying for one day of his time, he was actually donating one day of his time free. So that was incredible, I was really humbled by that. And uh, he now is getting paid by the university two days a week to do outreach work. So Leaf is concentrating on the colonists uh, on, in the Benhi area, and Colin is continuing this question of the landscape in the wider context around Benhi. I, I decided not to have pictures of archaeologists going like this. I decided to have pictures of archaeologists eating. <laughs> okay, it was thanks to Jeff that we actually got this funding. Um, and Leaf, again, I've got her eating. Uh, and again, this is the, what, uh, the area that Leaf's been working in. As I say, she's the link to the university. She's working on Ben He. And fortnightly, from about February till about August, and this will continue through the winter, She's been doing a lot of hands-on activity, getting the community out there and involved through looking at soil profiles, the chemistry, and she ran a dig in the summer. And we're starting to look now at cataloguing the pottery, and we've got somebody coming up to tell us a bit more about the pottery, and also working with Kemney Academy. This is Colin, and again, you can see how he's working. So we're working on a dig. This is actually Drummanure is Forbes Estate, and you remember I told you about the local landowners dividing Benny up. This is actually where the landowners started off. This is the poster that we did for the big dig. <coughs> Lovely that the university students came out, and we have bailers at the back, or members of the community, and they created this bear for carrying the stones out. So that was a wonderful approach, with students working with some of the uh, their bailers. Look. 
actually the dig. I mean, uh, we're still working on that. I know Lee's uh, sort of busy working on that, sort of uh, working out what the fines are and stuff like that. So I know we've had quite a lot of information about the digs, but this is the one of the colony houses, and we're looking at the floor structure, finding out a bit more. From this community project, we managed to get another book together. And we've got another book, we think, but that's lovely that the community can contribute towards their find. So we've got this other book here. You can see all the different people from the community, from the university, writing all about their find. We've got the schools writing in stuff here. We've also got an archive group, and this is the folk in the land, the land of the folk. This is sort of Ben He here. It's a lovely sort of textile wall hanging. Thanks to Colin Miller, this gentleman here, who was actually supposed to do this talk. But uh, we're working with Jackson, the Special Collection. This is a wonderful experience to actually look at all these lovely manuscripts and uh, they're doing a lot of work. What's wonderful is it's a self-discovery. This gentleman here, Ken, found recently in one of the works that have been catalogued a blue bit of paper in a ledger. And this blue bit of paper held all the rental records of the colonists. So that was just a new find. That was a, his eureka moment. Um, I'm going to be, can I have half, one more minute? Okay, I'm looking at that clock there. All right, now he's giving me that look. I said we were 40 years old, and um, part of it as a voluntary organisation, you're looking for money all the time, and that's what, something I need help with, please. But this year, the year of Natural Scotland, we've had artists involved with the hill, and they've been looking at giants, which is interesting, but what's also interesting, we've had scientists coming out to work with the artists. This has been, this is, this is actually amazing. This here is peat core, and this is a peat sample. And what's interesting about this is that this peat core was actually uh, 4.75 meters long, and that equates to 7,000 years of history. And in that core sample, so that's, we've got lots of pollen. <laughs> And that pollen to be looked at, and we were able to work out the vegetation that was on the hill. And that is so humbling to have this um, peat core in your hand. So one centimetre, it takes, to, uh, it takes 15 years to create one centimetre of peat. So, and what's happening with, with the artists, who are again working with the universe, again you can see lots of partners down here, also the council ranger service, there's the baileys. The art artists have been looking at the pollen. And what's interesting, they've looked at this pollen, we've been able to find out, we've found out the science, but we're also having a way of artists sort of getting involved. And they've actually created uh, pollen necklaces. And uh, the opening, as you can see, was actually only the other night. Um, so it was lovely to see that. This is the last slide. <laughs> Okay, this is where I need help, and this is going to be the rush bit. Okay, so the future. Leaf's only been with us for a year, and as I said to Leaf coming down the car, it takes a while to build up these partnerships. It's building partnerships with the university, there's obviously lots of district partners and others. We want to seek grants, obviously, to work on other historical periods. There's obviously the schedule monuments, there's other circles out with them. But we as a bailiff need to look at sustainability and how we, rather than always relying on grants, we want to actually support our volunteers, which they do themselves, but actually how we continue this question in the landscape. Um, so we're sort of very keen to hear on how groups sustain themselves without always applying for grants, because I think sometimes by applying for grants you compromise yourself, and certainly we're looking at microbreweries and things like that, so that's a way forward. So any other ideas would be greatly reasonable. 